Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about contraception and we're also going to be talking about conceiving children, process, and choice. I put all these together because, well, it opens up Pandora's box of psychology that often doesn't get talked about. Usually when we're thinking about psychology, right, we're trying to figure out those rare cases, mental illness, depression, anxiety, stress, all of these kinds of problems. We often forego or forsake just the normal day-to-day -day living and what it's like to be human and what's going on in people's minds and how are they trying to control their social environment? How are they trying to control their fate? How are they trying to regulate happiness? How are they coping with interacting with other people in the social context? It's incredibly complex. So for this chapter, I thought it'd be fun just to kind of introduce these ideas and look at it from a perspective, like how does all this stuff that we experience in life affect us psychologically? And what's going on in our mind when we're thinking about these types of things? So again, since we're in a psychology of sexuality class, this chapter highly looks at how we regulate uh, fertility, looking at contraception, social attitudes toward that, laws and attitudes and things along those lines. And then what happens when we have children? Uh, how does that affect our bodies, our brains, and also our social context? Um, but again, how do we get to a position where we can think about all of these things in our life? Well, one, we have to grow up a little bit. So once you hit that biological phase where you can begin to have babies, this opens up an entire new Pandora's box of the human experience, which is the ability to have kids and becoming parents. <laughs> and whether or not people are ever ready for that or whether people were born ready, you know, it differs with each person. And again, this is where we open up the Pandora's box of psychology. Everybody has different attitudes toward having kids. Some people love it and throw themselves into it. Some people really struggle with it and you're just tired all the time. <laughs> and then you hear like having kids is going to be the greatest thing you ever have. But then why do kids, are they, is that associated with a reduction in your sex life, a reduction in the quality of your relationships, a reduction in overall happiness? <laughs> And so is it the kid's fault or is it just that we find ourselves in these situations where we're adding on new responsibilities and we're not just thinking about ourselves, but we're thinking about others. But before we can ever get to the point of having kids, we have to experience that idea of conception, which is, you know, the sperm and the egg, the old adage tale of, you know, some people met and then all of a sudden you got some babies. <laughs> okay. Our sexual attitudes, what is cool sexually and what is not, vary with time. And so again, depending upon the epic we're in, the epoch we're in, E-P-O-C-H, <laughs> the time that we're living, depending upon the country that we live in, depending upon the type of state, the type of region, our political attitudes, all of these things influence our attitudes toward what is cool sexually, and then what is cool about having babies, okay? Some people believe that sex is fine. You should be allowed to have sex in a comfortable way. It doesn't really matter how many people you have sex with as long as it's positive and it's good. Other people believe you should only have sex with one person in your life, and that's the person you should marry. Um, some places like America, we're kind of more serial dating where we'll have like, you know, a long relationship, we'll break up, have a long sexual relationship, we'll break up. You see that a lot in America. America's pretty diverse though. You got everything from your random hookup culture to your three month culture, which I keep hearing from the kids these days. It's like the three month rule or something. My day it was like, you had to wait three days to call them after the first, you know, whatever meet. <laughs> I don't know, it's stupid. Uh, but again, our attitudes towards sexuality are highly regulated by cultural norms. So again, we look to culture to figure out what's acceptable and what's not. But it's not also that complex because our biology does play a role in what we think is acceptable and what's not. We can't deny that we experience things like jealousy, that men experience uh, a neurotransmitter that's released after they have sex with someone that causes them to be more territorial, for example or you know things like this that kind of regulate whether or not we're cool with having sex with one person or a lot of people or whatever it might be but again the same thing that 
the cultural attitudes that structure our sexual behavior, what's cool and what's not. Is homosexuality okay in the culture that we're living in? Is it not? Some places in the world, they'll still kill you for it. Some places in the world is totally fine. You can get married if you're a same-sex couple and have babies if you want. Again, so it's a complete toss-up, even in modern times, you know, depending on the country you go to. Like, if I was gay, I don't think I could go to every country in the world. It's just not safe for me. Same thing with being black. Is it safe to go everywhere if you're black, for example, in America? Even in modern times. Back in the day, we used to have things like sundown towns. If you were black, you better not be here at night or they'll lynch you. Okay? It's kind of like that. So, our sexual norms are regulated in the same way. If a girl were to get pregnant in the pre-1950s that's unmarried, that was such a huge social taboo. Ireland is just uncovering all the mass graves because the nuns would just kill all the babies of the unwed mothers because they were considered sin babies. That was a dark documentary I was watching the other day on that. Um, so, how we historically deal with pregnancy con contraception, <laughs> how we regulate our pregnancy, depends on the time frame. Now in America, in modern times, 4 out of 10 women have a baby unmarried. That is a complete radical shift from the past, okay? Historically, most people were shacked up, married, and having babies at 18. Now people are waiting until they're 28 years old. Only half of adults are married right now. And, you know, women are having less babies. Things are changing, Okay. If your book does introduce uh, contraception from a historical point, again, looking at how we regulate uh, pregnancy over several decades, you talked about the Comstock laws of the 1800s that said the only thing that's acceptable is abstinence or having babies. And then in the 1960s, you see a radical shift with, with the advent of birth control. So that's the first time that females could scientifically, I'm going to go with that, um, regulate period, no, not periods, but the ability to have babies. Sorry, I was thinking about what happens when you take birth control and how it affects your cycle and things along those lines, which I want to talk about in a second. So I'm just obviously always as a professor, you're like 10 steps ahead of where you're talking about. But that was the first time that women could do it scientifically. If we look at history, though, women that don't have access to abortion will take drastic measures from coat hangers to vitamin C to just look on the internet. There's a reason that doctors are adamant a lot sometimes about the ability to control this because if you don't allow doctors to do it, people will take means and in, you know into their own hands and it can be a huge threat for the life of females. So please do some research on that just to delve into it. Right now, in modern times, you had the overthrowing of Roe v. Wade, so abortion access has now been turned over to the states, and so now the states have the ability to regulate it, but then what you tend to find is in these states that are regulated compares that aren't, those who are not as socioeconomically affluent, people that tend to be minority races, um, immigrants, etc., don't have the ability to just hop on a plane or get in a car and go to a state that has abortion, and so it can negatively affect them a little bit more. Your book also talks about the idea of sharing responsibility. Um, you do see a high percentage of single mothers. I think for white females, I want to say it's like 25%, but it could be 40. I, I need to look at my stats. I should have looked at it before I came in here. For black mothers, it's really high, like 70%. And if you say, why is that the case? Again, what's the effect of racism on black males? Police targeting. The effect of growing up in a culture of poverty, again, these things are associated with being a single parent and then how that weighs in on you. Your book also talks about hormone-based contraceptives, uh, spermicide methods and uterine devices, emergency contraception, like, you know, when you can go to the to, you know, neck the morning after, the morning after pills, is that what they call that? I don't know the fancy name for it. Um, Looking into fertility awareness methods by informing females of what they have access to and informing males of what they have access to. And again, we definitely target females for this more than males with the exception of condoms. Um, sterilization, if you're looking at Native American females up until like 1970s, like almost like 40% of Native American females were sterilized by white doctors. You know, I mean, it's just an incredible atrocities of some of the social experiments that people have done in the past. Um, 
But you got to ask yourself, when we're looking at all these different forms of contraception, one, who is taking the forms of contraception is who is using it. And then you have to look at things like how does that affect your body and how does that affect your brain? And so a little, you know, maybe not often discussed enough is how do contraceptive devices affect your moods, affect your bodies, affect your hormones, affect all kinds of different things because they do. And so again, that's where the realm of so psychology comes in is like, okay, all these things that we're taking into our body and these methods that we're using to regulate our sexuality, how is this affecting our behavior? How is this affecting our sex drive? You know, things along those lines. What happens when a male gets, uh, you know, I don't want to say snipped, <laughs> a vasectomy, when a male gets a vasectomy, you know, and all of a sudden you don't have the same mixture of fluids, does that affect your sex drive or your hormone levels? You know, there's just a lot of questions that we should be asking. Because our sex drive, the chemistry associated with our sex drive, also affects our moods. It also affects our drives, our motivations, our behaviors, our goals, what we seek out in the social context, the type of stimuli that we're after, etc. So again, I really wanted to focus on this lecture, just looking at all of these things and how it affects us psychologically. Like begin with culture. Let's say you grow up in a culture where they believe abortion is bad and that people should be married before they have sex. How is that associated with the types of behaviors you might engage in and how you end up spending your life? Does it mean you're not going to have as much time to go focus on your career because you're going to go have five to eight to 12 babies and not have a time to be a working woman? You know what I mean? And so like if you look at attitudes toward... Um, having babies in like the country versus the city you see disparities girls in the countries tend to have a little bit more babies than girls in the city because what are girls in the city doing right they're getting their education then they're going into getting their careers they have access to birth control they don't have to just settle down and start a family right away they don't tend to have those accidents as much even if they did have an accident historically what they might call an accident not that it would be an accident so again don't twist those words but with, like again that's the psychology. Some people might look at like getting pregnant as, oh crap, it's an accident. Whereas other people are like, this is what life is all about inside of me, the meaning of it. And so again, the psychology of it all, this is what I'm saying, it's complex. And so again, depending upon the culture that you grow up in, how you're socialized and then the attitudes you internalize and then the attitudes you come up with yourself about stuff like this, that then affects the way that you cope with stuff, your perception of your experiences, etc. So, so some girls, maybe they want to have babies. And so when they get pregnant, they're excited and they're having positive emotions. Some girls don't want to get pregnant. And all of a sudden they're pregnant. And, oh, crap. The stress is coming out. And so then how does that affect the body and the baby? If you have a mom who's really stressed about having the baby versus a mom who's really excited, does that create different disparities? I have to look up. I, I don't even know. Like, does that affect things like baby's birth weight and stuff like that? I need to, every time I give a lecture, I just want to like get on the internet and start asking. You just always end up asking more questions every time you're learning. So now I want to know how does stress affect pregnant mothers? That's an awesome question. Terribly sad if that affects them. But now I need to know some specifics. Obviously, I'm not going to bore you with that, but I'll get back to you on that one. But again, thinking about things like that, like I have a wife and she always said she didn't know about uh, the in uterine devices because no doctors ever mentioned it. Well, why do doctors hesitate to inform girls about these types of methods and maybe push the birth control pill instead? Is it because attitudes about babies are influencing the types of treatments that doctors suggest? And again, that's all the realm of psychology. It's like, Social attitudes influence the way you think. Your psychological attitudes influence your behavior in the social context. And again, it's just this wonderful back and forth, this blend of bio and psycho and social, right? Like the social psychology or the biosociology or the whatever, however approach you want to take it, right? But again, the psychology of it all is also what's going on in people's minds when they're thinking about having babies. What's their relationship like? 
You know what I mean? Or, or how's it going with the person that they're with? Maybe they don't want a person and they just want to do it on their own because they're a girl who's got tons of money and they're like, I don't need a man. Who cares? I'm just not even, you don't even need tons of money. You just got, you're just good. You just don't need anybody else. You can take care of yourself without tons of money, whatever it might be. You know, I'm just throwing out different things, but that's the, all the other side of it too. And then once you have a baby and all of a sudden you're in a relationship, how's that going with the person you're with? <laughs> you know, y'all getting along? Is it causing stress on your relationship? Because it tends to. So the statistics say and the qualitative research also. So again, just kind of introducing this idea of conceiving children, process and choice, what's going on in people's heads. What are they thinking about when they're going to have babies? And then if they have babies, how does that affect them? How does it affect their life, their quality of life, their life experiences, their creativity levels, uh, their time management, their levels of stress, their happiness, their sadness, their moods? Is it increasing levels of violence in the house because people are stressed out? Now they're starting to act upon it, okay? So in places where you have access, parenthood is an option. In places where you're sexually added to, um, active and you don't, have access to things like abortion and things along those lines, parenthood isn't necessarily an option. And for many of us, it's just even with all of these things, it might not be an option. You can still get pregnant. But again, the likelihood of that happening is very low. But again, I mean, you know, if I were to look out and be realistic and look at all my friends in the world and people I see, you know, and I'd be like, how many of them actually sought out a baby or they just kind of end up with one? You know, again, that's also kind of the human experience. And I, I guess see differing things. Like, I see some people that are just the greatest parents ever. They're just, they do birthdays so good. And they're always at their kids' stuff. And then I see other parents that really struggle with it. They just want to kind of be there a little bit, but not completely. They don't necessarily want to be involved. Just throw some money at it, you know. And some people are mixed. And again, parenting styles are completely different. You guys will get that in all your classes, too. And so, again, that's all the realm of psychology. But, again, why are we even talking about it in the first place? Because, again, sexuality leads down a road. You become sexually active. This creates experiences in your life that then creates stimuli that then causes your brain to have to think about all this stuff that's happening. <laughs> okay. So, again, when you become pregnant, what's going on physically for the female and the male? Of course, there are major physical changes during the birth and then after the birth especially like we always tell moms you're going to be so happy you got your baby but is that really the realistic experience of all mothers think about it i mean postpartum depression exists for a reason because your body chemistry is changing you've gone from like this pregnant up person to a non-pregnant person that's some pretty radical stuff i mean your abs literally split in half <laughs> it's crazy I mean, the miracle of childbirth and all that and how your bodies can go through that kind of stuff. But men also experience it. Men, when we have babies, experience like a reduction in testosterone level. Why evolutionarily do men have less testosterone when we have a baby? Well, maybe it's so men aren't so aggressive and we become a little bit more passive and maybe a little bit more involved with the kids and not seeking out a bunch of other things. You know, there's reasons why body chemistry changes and rewards happen again why do we seek out sex in the first place because you get rewards it's dopamine it's oxytocin you feel close you feel good you get that serotonin kick afterwards right on right there's a reason you look at it and then when you have babies that then unfolds an entire life experience for you and then that can change your entire life radically could be wonderful it could be terrible and your kids can you know comment on how that went for them <laughs> okay so you you know all of us are humans being sexual is part of the human experience again there are many that are asexual so it's not the only end-all be-all but again the same thing with like mental illness we're always just talking about so much about the mental illness that we forget about all the other sides of things like just the general daily life what are people going through? What are people going through when they hook up and they have sex and they get in these relationships and they have babies? How does that affect them psychologically? I mean, there's a reason people go to therapists, <laughs> right? Some for good and just some for dark and sad, like child abuse and things like that. Eh, what can you do? It's really dark.
what can you do? I know we can do this. It's a stupid thing. I'm sorry. That's like a saying because I grew up in Chicago. What can you do? You can take many interventions, whether it's giving parenting classes or offering daycares for parents to drop off their kids like on the weekends and go out and have a date, and de-stress and maybe get close to things like that. Um, you know, whatever it might be, many interventions. Okay. Um, I think we've covered most of it. I really just, the book is going to go very deep into all the biology of contraception and social policies and attitudes and all through the body physical changes that are happening when you're pregnant, etc. So I've opened that up for a good assignment for you guys this week. But I really just, you know, I opened it up for you guys really focused on just looking at like relationships and sexual relationships and having babies and having families. And then how does all that influence you psychologically? I think it's a good part in this, you know, class to really be focusing on some of that. So I left it open for you guys for a discussion on that. Uh, but again, thank you so much and y'all have a wonderful day.